the psalms as public worship. So it's important, calling of the poor night is to say the psalms every day in the uh, divine office. And so it's uh, worthwhile to, to speak a little bit about what that means, the kind of responsibility that's attached to it, and also the mystical meaning behind it. So we start with a general principle, which is the duty of public worship. So man as a creature owes something to his creator. This is long forgotten in our society, which assumes that either we made ourselves or we have no responsibilities towards anyone except ourselves, even, and even sometimes not even that much. So as a creature, we owe praise back to our Creator for having made us. We also owe Him praise for everything that He has made in connection with us, because He made all things for our sake. So anything that is beautiful or worthwhile about the world is for man. So we also, when we see those things, we should also praise God because of them. So when we see a beautiful mountain range, or a lovely river, or a beautiful bird, those are things which should raise our hearts to God and praise Him for those things. Also, we are priests. So we know this from the New Testament, that St. Peter calls us in his first letter, he calls everyone a priest. What was in the Old Testament prohibited to only to the Levites, has been spread out through baptism to everyone. And what that means is that every Christian who is baptized can offer spiritual sacrifices to God. He does not need the ministerial priesthood and offer to, in order to offer sacrifices of his own making all day throughout the day. And so we have a calling in terms of being priests as Christians to offer back to God everything that we can to sanctify every moment, good and bad, of our lives and offer it back to him. Of course, we do that most perfectly when we offer it in consort with the ministerial priesthood at Mass. But we can also do that ourselves. That's why St. Peter uses that kind of language. So we have as, as these two principles, we as creature, we owe something to our Creator. And then as priest, we owe something. There's also the fact that we, among all the creatures that are material, are the only rational creatures. And so therefore we can take whatever is beautiful and lovely in the world and offer it to God as a sacrifice, either material or in an immaterial way, by simply offering it up all together with Him. So birds sing because God made them to sing and to praise Him, but we can take things like that. Also, we can make things such as an altar out of wood or stone and offer that back to God. So there are many ways in which man can take material creation and make it priestly, by making it something set apart for only use for God. In ancient societies, there were there was an importance to public worship. So this was really, in large part, if you just take one example, the controversy between the Roman Empire and Christianity was over partly over the issue of whose God should be worshipped. So many of the Romans who clung to paganism at the time when Christianity started to become on the rise, especially during the times of St. Ambrose and St. Augustine, they objected to Christianity because the gods, the traditional Roman gods, would not be served properly, and therefore it was bound to bring havoc upon the empire. In fact, many of them thought that the sack of Rome in 410 was because the Romans had by and large abandoned their own gods and had begun to worship the Christian gods. So that just is one example of the way in which ancient societies thought it was necessary, no matter if they were worshiping false gods or true God, that they should have a society devoted to worship, that it was a duty of society that you would set apart some group, usually of men and sometimes of women, to only worship God at those times. So we also have Rome. Rome had the Vestal Virgins. They were consecrated for a part of their life to the worship of God. And if they uh, went against that, then they were buried alive and saved. So they took it very seriously. As Americans, we don't have such a thing. So the American society is built partly on the idea of everybody can worship their own God as long as they do it in their houses and don't bother anybody else about it. So that is a great flaw with our society, is that we allow for anything in terms of worship, for anything from devil worship to worshiping the true God, the Trinity. We, all, all those, we allow all those things publicly. But then also, we don't have any uniform, any sort of organized system of worshiping God. So we assume that everyone will do it in their own homes. But that was not a, a, a characteristic of any of the ancient societies, and even any society leading up until probably the time of uh, the Protestant Revolution in Europe. There probably was nothing else that, that a 
is even similar to what we have today, which is that people don't think they owe an obligation to God, and that society owes no obligation to God at all in terms of worship. So the church says this about her worship. So if, um, there are many things that have been written in the past 50 years which are of negligible value, but one of the things which is very much worth reading is the introduction to the Liturgy of the Hours, the new uh, Liturgy of the Hours. It was written very well, and it talks about many principles of worship uh, with great clarity and even sometimes forcefulness, which is surprising. So I'm going to quote it a, pub a few times in the opening. It says, Public and common prayer by the people of God is rightly considered to be among the primary duties of the church. So I would say it's the primary duty of the church. <clears throat> the reason we were created excuse me, <clears throat> was to worship God rightly. So one of the reasons why Christ came, St. Thomas Aquinas says the primary reason he came was to save us from our sins, because that's what his name means, is Savior in Hebrew. And also when the angel told both Our Lady and Joseph who was uh, who she would conceive. They said that his name was to be Jesus because he would save us from our sins. But one of the other duties that he had in coming to the earth was to teach us about the true God so we could worship rightly. So the Moses and the uh, people of Israel who were faithful knew that there was one God and only one God. But what they did not know is that that God was also three persons. And therefore, in the fullness of time, that should be revealed to us so we could worship even more perfectly than what the Jews used to worship. So in doing that, it made our primary duty to worship the true God on earth, so that whoever worships, worships false gods, and everyone, uh, even those who say they have no God, their God is themselves, or their God, they have demons who are gods that they worship in some way. Because it's impossible for man not to have a God. He is made in such a way that he knows he is a creature, even very intuitively in his heart, and therefore he cannot block that out by thinking about it in a different, renovated way. There's no way that man can escape certain things about himself. So we only among those in the world are faithful who worship the true God who he's revealed himself to be, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And therefore we have a, right, we have a duty as a church to worship that God at all times, all during the day, every day of the year. Because otherwise he is not worshipped properly anywhere else except within the church. It goes on to say, since we're entirely dependent upon God, we must acknowledge and express the sovereignty of the Creator, as the devout people of every age have done by means of prayer. So that's getting back to my point about the creatures, and therefore we have a duty to worship Him as Creator. It also says, in Christ and Christ alone, human worship of God receives its redemptive value and attains its goal. So Christ taught us how to pray, and he also teaches us how to worship his Father. So that he remains, even, even though he has ascended into heaven, he remains the bridge between man and God. He is the true priest that I share in ministerially and you share in through baptism. But we worship in him, we worship the Father, who is the origin of the world and of the other two persons. So it's only through Christ that human worship is perfected. If we lose sight of that, then we think that anything that anybody else offers is just as good as our prayer or the public prayer of the church, which is not true. The public prayer that we offer in Mass in the Divine Office is the most perfect prayer and the most fitting worship of God that exists in the entire world and has ever existed. And lastly, it says communities of canons, the canons are first, monks, nuns, and other religious who celebrate the liturgy of the hours by rule or according to their constitutions. So I'd include the four knights in that. You're not properly religious, but you take real vows in the church, which are public. And therefore, you have a, a duty by right and according to constitutions to offer the office every day. In whole or in part, these groups represent in a special way the church at prayer. They are a fuller sign of the church as it continually praises God with one voice, and they fulfill the duty of working above all by prayer. So that's an ancient argument, which we're still fighting against the hierarchy, that we work by praying, but that is actually work. So none of the, none of the bishops believe that, except they're really, really good ones. But. Okay, so uh, we are a sign, the church at prayer is a sign of, what everyone should be doing all the time. We all have duties. So the poor knights share in that 
the uh, office of the church, which is the highest when they, when they say the divine office, especially together, but even privately. We have a rule in our constitutions where if we can't be present at the divine office, which is celebrated together, we have to move our lips as we say it, and if possible, if we're not in a public place, say it out loud, so that we're still imitating what would be done publicly. Because every time we say the office, it is a public prayer, because it's the chair prayer that the church does throughout the day. If we do it privately, it's still a public prayer of the church. Even, even a mass that I just offered, even though it's in private, it's public because the angels and saints are there, and it's also offered for the living and the dead. So it can't be a private thing that I offer only by myself for myself. Right, in modern society, as I, as I uh, said briefly, we believe in religious freedom. That's something that the, the, uh, the philosophers, since, particularly since the time of Descartes onward, have, have given to us that we can be religiously indifferent about things. And that religion, we've been reading a book by Tom, William Thomas Walsh on the characters of the Inquisition. And he starts with a very long chapter on Moses, which you're just not expecting, as you expect him to get right to the punch of the thing, but he spends about 20 pages on Moses. And one of his points is that if, if, if we order the things in human society, then the way we think and act towards God is the most important. So that should shape our society first, not be the last thing that people do in their houses and you can do however you wish, which is basically what American religion amounts to. So we believe in religious freedom, and therefore we also believe in religious indifference. So because we allow everyone to worship as they please, we also say that all religions are created equal and therefore everyone can do whatever they want, as long as they don't bother the other religious groups or bother people who don't want to do religion at all. Okay, this is a very complex question which has to be, like the issue of toleration versus persecution and things like that, that's, a, that's another talk to, to speak about at greater length in terms of the church's philosophy on these issues. Basically what she allows right now is a certain religious toleration because she realizes in these pluralistic societies to protect the church sometimes we have to allow a certain indifferentism in order for the church to survive and not be squashed under uh, regimes like the Soviet Union and whatever is coming in this country. So religious indifference, because of that then there's no one who actually pays attention to the idea that God ought to be worshipped properly and that there should be people praying and worshipping God all day, all the time. So if um, if, if we were president of the United States and we were wanting to set a policy, then the first thing we should think about is how is God treated in this society and how can he be better served? And if we were thinking logically, we'd say, well, we should have a class of people who worship God all day and that we either paid them to do that or we made it possible for them to live free so they could devote themselves to worship. So that's what the Catholic Church, who is the perfect society, does. She promotes men and women to worship God all day, every day, and then she pays for their means. So that's the whole idea of priests um, and religious who are supported basically by the goodwill of the laity. The whole idea is that we're supposed to work primarily by worshiping God, because you realize you can't do it all the time, so you pay us to do it, in a way of speaking. You support us. It's not simony, because we're not doing the sacraments for pay but you support us to allow this kind of thing to exist in the church and continue to exist. Everywhere the communists came in Europe, the first thing they did is they took all the useless priests who all they were doing was praying every day and they put them and put them to work and did something useful like teach in a school or work in the factory or something. So it's a sign of a bad society that's on the decline and thinks that prayer is not worth anything. So the role of the Psalms in the public worship of the church they're really important. They're called by the church the marrow of the worship. So if you think about the human body, the marrow is extremely important. Um, and it has to be living in order for the person to survive and the bones to be healthy. And it's also a place where if you take away from it, it's extremely painful. And it takes away like the heart of what it is to be a human body. So the way we know that is if you study the mass carefully, either the, the ordinary and extraordinary form, the problem with the ordinary form is that a lot of the public parts where psalms are said, they're no longer said uh, by because you have opening hymn and closing hymn, which is not the traditional part of Catholic worship. That's Protestant worship. That's not actually Catholic. We have psalms that we said as the priests are coming in, 
and then psalms at different times in the, in the liturgy. If you read St. Justin Martyr, who died in around 150, he lays all of this out very clearly, that the kind of worship we have now with the psalms is the same that they had in the ancient church. It's also obviously the heart of the divine office. The divine office is built around the fact of saying the psalms, all 150 psalms in a week, and then you add to that other things, mostly so we don't get bored, and to celebrate the different feasts of the church. So in the ancient church with the monks, they said the psalms without any extra things added to it. But we have antiphons, and we have hymns and, uh, and versicles so that we can even keep our attention and that we can be attuned to the different feasts of the church every day. But if you carefully study the Mass, which is what I would ask you to do, and then, um, maybe not while you're on retreat because you might not have time, but when you go back to your respective places, look at the Mass text from your Missal and see how many times the psalm is quoted. It's at the introit. Everything the Stola sings is a psalm. And then the psalms are also alluded to other times during the liturgy. All right, briefly, a history of their use is, in the Jewish tradition, they were, they were used constantly. It was the prayer book of the Jews, particularly in the temple. So we even know from the Acts of the Apostles that Peter and John would go to the temple to continue to pray the Psalms with the Jewish people, even after Christ had ascended. They continued to participate in that part of the worship. Because there's the story of them going up at the time of Nome at 3 p.m. and finding there the man who, who was lame and then healing him, and then the whole uh, scene unfolds that way. But what they're going to do is to pray the Psalms in the temple with the priests and the other laity who prayed them at that hour. In the monasteries in the very beginning, we had the Desert Fathers, and what they did was they prayed all the Psalms in one day. That was their objective. And that was to for two reasons. The one was to keep Paul's adage to pray at all times and to never cease praying. So they tried to do that by using God's word, which is the Psalms, and praying them. Uh, and when they were there with fatigue, they might sit down for a little bit or do something else, but then they would go back to prayer as soon as they felt like they had the bodily strength to do it. It was considered lax to not do all the Psalms in a day. And if you could do more than that, then that was considered to be better. Some of the Irish monks would do like a thousand psalms a day. So they're, they're the real ascetics with the Irish monks. Okay? In, the, in the meantime, they'd be like kneeling in the river and doing a thousand genuflections at the same time. They were crazy. Okay? <laughs> then eventually, what, mostly what St. Benedict offered to the church was he codified this and brought it to be a more reasonable distribution for monks who lived together. So they did other things like they, they uh, um, tended their fields and they kept the monastery clean and they cooked food for everyone and they had other jobs so that they had specific amounts of time where they prayed the psalms. And then later what developed was also in the cathedrals. The cathedrals had specific way of praying which was more theme thematic. So the, the psalms would speak about the morning and the sun. They would use those at lauds and then at vespers those of the sun setting and the incense rising those kinds of things would be done. So they kept the things in the temple, which was that a lamb was sacrificed in the morning and the evening. That was what the cathedrals did, whereas the monks prayed all during the day. So the thing I failed to mention was there's also a part in Psalm 118 where David says, he prayed seven times a day and he also rose in the night to praise God. So the monks tried to do that, where they prayed seven times, and that's where we get the number of the hours. And then the time of rising in the at night was matins. So traditionally what happened was the monks broke their sleep at midnight or in the early morning at one or two. They got up and said matins and then lauds also with that. Then they would go back to bed for a period of three to four hours. They would rise at sunrise around 6 a.m. and say prime. That's where prime comes from. Then they would go to their work for the next couple hours. Terse was at nine, sex at 12 known at three, Vespers at sunset, and then Compline before they retired. So they had a system according to the sun and also to certain mysteries of our Lord's life and to this mystical thing of, the, of, of King David, of how many times he prayed a day, that we keep that tradition. So that's also why it's fitting if we can to keep the hours generally at the times in which they're set, because that's something which has been done since the very early times in the church. And it also enables us, if you think about the way that the time zones work, 
is very effective. So if someone is praying in the Eastern time zone sext, then an hour later, someone in the Central time zone will be praying sext. And so the idea of the church worshiping God all during the day is, is kept up by keeping the hours at those specific times. Because someone in the next time zone is coming up behind you to pray that hour so that God is not forgotten during that time. Right, the rest of it will be about three voices that we find in the Psalms. So when we say the Psalms, especially as we say the Divine Office, it's important to realize that we're not saying them for ourselves primarily, but for the sake of the Church, and also we're being the voice of Christ. So the first voice is Christ. He is called by the Liturgy of the Hours in the introduction, the highest worshiper. So because of his humanity, he can also worship the Father through his human nature. So he is a priest in his human nature, and therefore he can offer fitting sacrifice through his human nature back to God. As God himself, he cannot worship himself, because that, that would not make that doesn't make logical sense. But as a, with his human nature, he can do that. And therefore, he is the epitome of what it is to worship. So we find that on the way that he taught us how to pray, and we also find it particularly in his own sacrifice of himself on the cross. That's the highest worship that can be offered. We imitate that, but we also share in it. So because we're members of Christ's body, as St. Paul tells us, then we pray, just as our head prays in heaven, we, the body, also pray on earth. And we don't pray in a divided way, as if we offer our prayers and then it's... See, this is something important to think about mystically. Christ prays through us and in us. It's not that we pray and Christ prays and then we add it together and it equals one thing. It's that he prays through us. So he continues to pray and worship the Father through us. It's one action, which is continual, and because it's divine, because of his divine nature, it's spread out through the centuries and can still be one united thing. We, we really, all we do in the Mass and the Office is continue to worship on the cross for all of the in duration of the Earth's time. We just continue that. That's why we... It's right to say it's only one sacrifice, but we simply participate in it over the centuries in the same law. So the liturgy is the visible sign of Christ's work after the ascension. After he ascended, we can't see him now in his actual, in his real body. And we can see him, of course, in his sacramental body. But in his real physical body, he's in heaven, which we cannot see. But the way that he continues to worship is on earth is primarily through us, through saying the office. So in the general introduction, it says, those who pray the Psalms in the name of the church should be aware of their full sense, especially their messianic sense, which was the reason for the church's introduction of the Psalter into its prayer. So we're not just continuing a Jewish tradition. We are, but it's not as simple as that. It's also that every time we pray the Psalms, we find the, the prophecies for Christ in them. We find them fulfilled. And so we continue to tell them to the whole world. There's a section in Augustine's Confessions, I think it's in Book 8, where he talks about that just before he became a Christian, he went on retreat with his mom and a few of his cousins, and also his son. And while they were there, they prayed the Psalms, and he said, I wish, it was with Psalm 4, that's what he's particularly talking about, he said, I wish I could pray this and sing it for the whole world to hear, so that they could listen to what God says, and their pride would be squashed, and humility would so even if no one is listening, by us praying the psalms continually, then we still perform their, their meaning in the world, so that those who can, those who have ears, will listen, because we continue to pray them. Remember, we, we should think not always practically, but many times we should think more mystically and theoretically about what we're doing, because that helps us to understand why we do it even when no one is present. Why we do it when it's 11.45 at night, and you wonder why you're saying the Psalms when you should be in bed or doing something else which you really want to do. This is why. Because we continue to fill up the worship of the church in a way which does change the world even if they don't know that they're being changed by it. Where it says, following this line of thought, the fathers of the church saw the whole Psalter as a prophecy of Christ in the church and explained it in this sense. And they had the right to hear in the singing of the Psalms the voice of Christ crying out to the Father, or the Father conversing with the Son. So mystically speaking, what we do is we continue to give Christ voice on earth as he praises the Father, and then we allow the Father to speak back to the Son in this mystical sense. 
the Holy Spirit working through us to, to perform this action. So that's also why the choirs are divided, because it's as if Father and Son are speaking back and forth to one another. Some examples of this which we encounter in the office, I chose some that you all, since you don't typically pray Matins, that you would, you would encounter. So Psalm 21, which is Friday Prime, uh, that's the long psalm about Christ's passion. We find in there, this is an obvious literal sense applying to Christ. It says, all they that saw me have laughed me to scorn. They have spoken with their lips and wagged their head. He hoped in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him save him, seeing that he delights in him. For many dogs have encompassed me, the counsel of the malignant has besieged me. They have dug my hands and my feet. They have numbered all my bones. They have looked and stared upon me. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they cast lots. So that's a few of the verses from Psalm 21, which hopefully you're familiar with in, in some ways, being that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's how it begins. So the literal sense of this psalm applies to Christ. Uh, St. Thomas has, has something very strong to say about this, St. Thomas Aquinas. He says, it should be known that expounding upon the Psalter, as in other prophecies, we should avoid an error that was condemned in the Fifth Synod, which means the Council of Constantinople. Theodore Homsuetius said that in sacred scripture and the prophecies, nothing is explicitly said about Christ, but about certain other things. But they accommodated it to Christ, as in Psalm 21, they divided my garments. This is, Theodore Homsuetius said, it was not said of Christ, but of David, as according to the text. But this mode is condemned in the council, and he who says scriptures are so to be expounded is a heretic. So these heresies have been revived in our own times, particularly through German biblical scholarship since the 1800s. So Psalms apply directly to Christ. So we should not, in this case, the strongest argument is if you read through it, and then you read David's life, you don't find anywhere where he had his hands and feet, feet pierced or things like that. This is an obvious psalm to be applied to Christ. It was also used by Christ on the cross, saying that this psalm applies to me, what was what he was saying by crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What he wanted to do by saying that on the cross was to introduce the whole psalm, which speaks about his life, both his passion and his triumph at the end. So when we continue to do this, Christ gives us the chance to share in his passion by reciting the psalm with him. And so it's a mystical way in which we can participate in it. We should never think of Christ's work as having been while well, he was on this earth and now it's done. We know that's not true because he did what was necessary for him to do, but we have to pass it on, share it with others, and allow others to participate in the sacraments so they too can be saved. So Christ's passion can save all that are willed to be, he wills to be saved. And that we can participate as fully in it as possible. So he, he calls us not only to be saved, but also mystically to share in his passion and his resurrection. And by saying these psalms, we continue to do that. We also tell the whole world that they would listen, that this psalm is about Christ's passion and his resurrection, and please listen. So we continue to say that even if the only ones who are with us are the angels and the saints when we say the office. Another psalm which applies to Christ is Psalm 109, and this is Sunday Vespers, it's the first psalm. It's also the first psalm for many of the feast days, or all feast days, and then many of the commons that we might have to say during the year. So like, we have it tomorrow for first Vespers, for second Vespers of Sunday, it's the first psalm, but then we also have it on the Feast of St. James this week and also St. Anne, so it happens many times. It's a psalm which begins, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. The Lord will send forth the scepter of thy power out of Zion. Thou rule in the midst of thy enemies. With thee is the principality in the day of thy strength, in the brightness of the saints. From the womb before the day star I begot thee. The Lord has sworn, and he will not repent. Thou art a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This psalm has been applied from the early Christian times to Christ. So one way in order to make our prayer richer, the church is telling us, is to think about the ways in which these psalms apply to Christ. And even if, if we're saying this altar in Latin and we don't understand it as well as we, we can or should, then we should at least take time outside of the time of the office and read through the psalms in English so we can have an idea of what we're praying when we do pray them. 
And then to think about other times when we're doing something else. The whole idea, of, another idea of saying the Psalter is that we're fed by it, and therefore when we go off to do other things,